Hello and welcome to the Ireland on the Fly podcast about the people and places of fly fishing in Ireland. With restrictions starting to ease, many of us are making plans or have been getting out onto our local rivers or waters where possible. And if you're still not able to, well, at least there's fly tying videos and podcasts like this one to keep you entertained for the meantime. On this week's episode, I speak to Ronan Crean, a Roundstone native who became so obsessed with the brown trout fishing in New Zealand that he finally made the jump and moved there full time where he is now a highly successful guide. Ronan speaks about his love of fly fishing in New Zealand as well as the sheer size of the brown trout and how to catch them. It's a fascinating insight into fly fishing that many of us can only dream about. From Roundstone in County Galway, um, and uh, I ended up in New Zealand uh, in 2002. I travelled from Ireland to New Zealand to fish, um, and I spent a, I spent a year uh, spent a year in New Zealand then, and uh, got under my skin. And um, I, I kept I, I kept returning basically. Um, so every every season for I think nine or nine or ten years after that first visit, I uh, I came over and fished New Zealand. And um, and then in about 2011, I decided I'd make the move more permanent, and I've I've been here since. So you so you literally you did go over at the start just for fishing reasons. It was pure love of yeah, fishing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, for, for the love of fishing, I knew I heard of New Zealand as a as a great fishing destination. So I um, I, yeah, I came to I came to fish. I mean, I I, had, I did no research. I didn't even know. When the season was open, and I actually I just I just happened to arrive at the very start of the season, um, but I also came over to work. Um, you know, so I, it was a one-year working holiday visa that, that I came on uh, the first time ever, and um, and uh, yeah, that that's that was how I how I, how it how it started. So, what was the fishing like when you first arrived? Was it just literally jaw-dropping? Holy shit, this is so different to what we've got back in Ireland. Um, yeah, it, it was, it, I mean, yeah, it, it didn't take long to realize, um, just how incredible it was and how vast it was and, um, how, how much, how, how much more diverse it was than, than what I was used to in Ireland. Um, and, uh, yeah, I, I, I mean, like I remember my, my first experience fishing for trout in New Zealand was actually, uh, on the Nanataha river mouth, um, uh, on the North Island fishing at nighttime. <laughs> so the first trout I ever caught in New Zealand was actually in the, in the dark. I caught three of them that night. And, uh, so that was the start. Um, but it, it, it was, it was great. I mean, it's just, just, it continued really interestingly from then on. And, and so you, you basically, you got, you got the taste of it. Um, and you would come out kind of for a few months every year then, was it just to fish? So would you kind of work in Ireland during the year, save up a bit of money and head over? Or? That's exactly it. Yeah. I, I'd, I'd, um, I'd work in Ireland and then, and then, and then f- fly over to New Zealand, uh, it, usually at the start of every season, but sometimes it was a bit later depending on finances. And then I'd, and then I just stay here basically for as long as I could. Um, so I, I usually for three to six months out of every season, I'd I'd be in New Zealand. God, that must have been incredible though. Like spend like what you were. Pre- I presume you're in your twenties then, just spending months, just literally traveling around fishing. Like, yeah, that's that was it exactly. So I'd I'd basically arrive in around about October or November, and um, and spend three to six months traveling around fishing every day. So I had some mates uh, that well, one one friend in particular, Paul Arden. Um, he was doing the same thing, so we used to kind of meet up, and we he had vehicles, so we'd split the cost of diesel and maintenance and all that kind of stuff. And it was great. I mean, it was an incredible time fishing and just the crack that was with it, you know. To do that, like you know, people are into fly fishing, fair enough, yeah, and you know, but for most people, it's part time. The fact that you actually kind of were that obsessed with it that you would just come out and do it for months is, is it a bit kind of like was is there a bit of a kind of like the surfing culture, nearly a bit of it over there, like that, you know, where you're kind of traveling around camp. There is. There is. Yeah, there is definitely. I mean, I mean, I didn't know anything about that when I first came out. Um, but as a, you know, as I've, as I've come to, to, to learn over the years, there are, there are people that, you know, there are people now doing exactly what I did. Um, you know, and, and they're, some of them are young in their early twenties. Uh, but not just that, like there's a few of them in their thirties as well and <laughs> getting on into their forties and more doing the same thing. So yeah, it, it it it's it's a it's a thing that happens. Certainly, I imagine it's a lot like the surfing culture. Yeah, you grew up in Roundstone, um, an absolutely beautiful part of the country. Um, and so, did you grow up with fishing near you? Was it? Yeah, I grew up. I grew up uh, with plenty with fishing all around me. Like the the mountain lakes were good for trout, um, but usually quite small, like up to maybe a, a half a pound or a pound. And then occasionally you'd get fish up to two or three pounds on some of the lakes. Um, but I also had the carob very close by. 
uh, and uh, myself and my father used to fish the carb an awful lot. In fact, my first my first day fly fishing was on Loch Carb with my father and my grandfather. Um, and uh, I also spent a lot of time in Ireland uh, working on Dalna Hinch River and uh, Loch Ina as a as a ghillie. Um, so I, I, and uh, Kyle Moore as well. I, I always knew fly fishing was for me. Um, like I remember the, at the very beginning, fly fishing with my dad and. Uh, Dad is an, an incredibly focused, dedicated angler, and you, you know he he loved taking me fishing. But when we'd be out in the wa- out on the water together, I was twelve, and my hands used to get really cold, and uh, you know I'd get into a tangle, and, and and I'd hate ask I'd hate to ask Dad to get the tangle out because, I mean, he always would take the tangle out, but he never wanted to put his rod down to help me because he was watching the water in front of him, and he hated to miss any little bit of that drift. Um, I always remember that, but. Uh, uh, but he, yeah, it was it was a great time. Was it kind of was lake fishing what you kind of grew up with and what you knew the best when you were growing up? Yeah, yeah, mostly lakes. So so I, I grew up fishing the mountain lakes and uh, and carob and mask and cara. Um, they were they were my mainstay of of of, uh, of that was my my main fishing. Um, and then and then yeah, the the sea trout river, the sea trout. Uh, fish, sea trout and salmon fisheries that that were local as well. I fished those. When you think of the size of the fish in in Ireland, the wild brown trout versus the size of the fish in New Zealand, was it was that part of the kind of the attraction and the allure in New Zealand? Just the sheer. Difference? Oh yeah, absolutely, absolutely. I mean, there's no no doubt about it. Uh, you, you know, I remember, you know, the the introdu- my introduction to New Zealand was going out and and straight away catching you know three and four pound trout, uh, which were you know in Ireland they're they're really really good great fish super fish no matter you know on any lake in the country um and over here they were they were pretty stock standard um and i love that uh and then you know uh, so my, my first year out here I, I really just fished for those uh which were in abundance in a lot of the rivers um and then as time went on i got a bit more confident and i was i i i, I would you know take on the the rivers and lakes that held bigger trout which were quite daunting at first i have to say you, you know you you really have to get a bit of experience behind you before you can well for me anyway i wanted to get a bit of experience behind me before i felt comfortable going after those really really big fish you might just explain to people in terms of kind of the the, the lie of the land maybe in terms of where the where the best fishing is and maybe just gives a bit of background to it in every, every region has something great to offer um and on, on a very general kind of le- level the North Island uh, has more more rainbows than browns, um, and generally more fish probably that are a little bit easier to catch. Down south, it's um, uh, you have more brown trout that are bigger, usually a little bit more difficult to to, to catch. So the South Island is um, is is a it's just a little bit more difficult um, than the North Island. Uh, but um, probably better rewards. And then within the South Island itself, then uh, I suppose you could say the oh, the west coast of the country would be um, a great place to go for, for just spectacular scenery, uh, but not necessarily to go after your really, really big trout. Um, the east coast is, is, a, is, a, is, is good, good for very big fish, as is the central, the, the, the center like around here, the central Otago is good, good big fish country too. Uh, where, would you, where are you based and where would you bring most people? Uh, I'm based in Central Otago, a, a town called Alexandra, and uh, I fish within a I fish um, basically. Oh God, uh, I, re- I really just I, f- I fish all over the lower the lower half of the South Island. So, depending on what people want or um, what the weather's doing or what I feel like doing, I go. I could go any direction from here, north, south, east, or west. Is there a bit of everything for people like, you know, it's difficult fishing, you know, hard to catch fish if you want, if you're more experienced or, you know, if somebody's a beginner that you can take them to, to easier rivers? Is it, is it you've got that kind of mix? You do to a certain extent. Um, yeah, you, you, you do. I mean, if somebody if somebody you know really wants to go after a big fish, then they you, you, you do need a, a high level of, of quite a high level of skill because. Uh, to catch the really the really big ones, it's not that they're any harder to catch necessarily than a small fish, but there 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 are much fewer of them. So when the shot presents, you have to make that shot count, um, and you 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 rarely get more than one opportunity to make the cast. So and and you know like book fever often kicks in, and even a good angler can just completely balk under the pressure of a big fish. But um, so if you if you're targeting big fish, you do need a high level of skill, and then everything under that. Uh, it's just sort of whatever is best on the day. 
more than uh, more than like this like if there was a river that was great for beginners you know, I, I tend to take everybody there. I mean, you know, because that's going to be good fishing and good fun. And at the end of the day, that's what people want. But it's it, it's it's not not quite as simple as that. And, and is it mainly sight fishing? Yes, yes. Um, mostly sight fishing, but you have to be able to blind fish. Um, you know, you have to be able to read the water and know if you can't see a fish in a certain little gutter or, or a run, um, sometimes it just screams fish. So, you know, you have to run your fly through it. Um, and uh, so, yeah, it's it's mostly sight fishing, but I'd never walk past a piece of water that looked great if I couldn't see a fish in it. You know, if, if it's yeah, you, you'll, you'll pick up a lot of fish on the blind. It, does it take a bit of getting used to actually? I just think, you know, if, say for, if you've got anglers, say from Ireland, where, you know, that are, aren't used to that kind of sight fishing, that it, it nearly, like you said, it ups the ante that if you're you feel the pressure a bit more that if you are actually fishing to fish that you can see like that and you can see it's a decent size. Yeah, it, it does. I mean, it, it does. Um, it, uh, it, people do get a, get a bit nervous about it uh, at first, but the excitement of just being able to see to see the fish sort of... Um, it, you, people get over it pretty quick and, and just see the fun, the fun side of it, you know, to actually have a target to cast at rather than just, just, uh, just repetitively casting and covering water. Um, it, it really adds a, an amazing dynamic to fly fishing that that I just that I didn't that I didn't have in Ireland. I mean, I never once sight fished a trout in Ireland. Would you still enjoy fishing in Ireland, although it's different? Oh, oh, oh God, yeah. Don't get me wrong at all. I absolutely adore Ireland. Um, I love fishing back home. Um, I mean, even even when I come home, I, I I mean, I get home every year, and I'll still go back to Ryan's Lake where I started fishing, and I'll I'll, I'll still get pretty excited about catching, you know, four fish to the pound. Um, you know, and if you catch one fish, catch a ten-inch fish on that lake, you know that's like catching an eight-pound brown over here. Um, and, and you know, the, the size of the fish is always very relative to where you are. Uh, so I'm not, I'm, I'm not, um, I, I've, I've never, I, I, I still love Ireland. I mean, Loch Ina is still one of my favourite lakes to fish anywhere in the world. Like, so it's, uh, yeah, still very, very, very close. So, Ronan, you might just tell me what's the fly fishing pressure like over there in New Zealand? In the New Zealand fishery is not, it's not a numbers fishery. You're, it's, it's about it's about small numbers of quality fish. So you're walking up a river, you're sight fishing, or even if you're blind fishing, one angler can effectively cover all of the water. Um, so if you're, if you're coming up behind somebody, uh, the water is already fished and all, and the fish that are there have already been fished over and they're not going to take uh, another fly. So, um, uh, it's, 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 it's important. So the, the pressure aspect, it's, it's, it's really important that you've got a fresh piece of water and ideally, a piece of water that hasn't been fished for a few days, um, and like I said, it's 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 get, getting harder to find that, but it's still possible. So, does it is it a case of is it a lot of hiking, or kind of you're really kind of trying to find those spots? Yeah, yeah, hiking helps, um, but it's 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 more about knowing knowing. Um, it's more about having knowing a lot of accesses to a lot of rivers, um, and and it, and I think that's the key. Uh, and and the, the the longer I've been here, the, the more I'm. The more I'm learning about, you know, the amount you, you need to, as a, as a fishing guide or a, as a just a person who loves to fish, to be successful at it, you you need to have a shitload of 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 um, of uh, lo- localities, uh, locations to fish. You need to have just a lot of places to go, and the more places you have to go, then the the the, the more chance you, you have of being able to avoid avoid uh, other anglers. And what's the access like? Like, is it is it is it private? Is it public? What's how does that work over there? For the um, most of the rivers in New Zealand have something that's known as the Queen's Chain on it, and what that is is basically that's that's twenty two yards on either bank that's uh, public access. So, in other words, anybody can anybody can walk the banks, but you have to be able to get to the bank via a pub via um, a public road like a bridge, or um, um, a bridge mainly, or or. or if a farmer allows you to access the river through his through his land, you can you know you can obviously access it through his land. But then once once you're on the river, you can walk to your heart's content up the river. It's a bit like America, I suppose, actually, isn't it? So it's 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 get like the the, the access to the river might be for public use, but it, like you said, it's actually getting onto the the river itself is the issue. Like, yeah, I mean, like it, it, so the, the Queen's Chain allows people to fish both banks of the, of the river freely. Um, and and access is generally easy. I mean, farmers are generally very good about giving access if you ask them. Um, and uh, and quite often they 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 have a they 
uh, F- Fish and Game, the the organisation over here that looks after the the fisheries, they they they'll often um, speak with the farmers and set up permanent anglers access points uh, through through private properties. So uh, access to the rivers is actually very very good over here. Um, some of it is very publicly known, and some of it is, is is less publicly known. But there's there's you know there's a lot of public access that people don't realise are actually public accesses, and I think that's that's the uh, that's kind of the the you need to the more of those kinds of places you know the better to 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 keep the pressure at bay. You know, are there private fisheries as well? Yeah, it's all it's all public, and I mean you know that that's, that 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 is ninety nine percent of the ninety nine percent good. Uh, um, but then the only downside is y- you might make a huge effort to get to a piece of water. You know, you might walk for a couple of days to get somewhere. You might spend big bucks and fly in uh, and you can find somebody else there. And, uh, you, you know, if, if that happens, it's um, you, you just have to meet, have, go and have a, have a chat with the person and try and share the water. But, uh, you know, it's, it's not ideal. And, and tell me this in terms of like, what's the kind of best size fish you got over in New Zealand? Uh, I've had uh, browns up to twelve pounds. I've had, um, <laughs> I've landed, I've landed eight now over ten. Um, but to put that into to, to put that into into perspective, that might sound like a good number, but I've I, I don't know how many days I've fished here now, uh, two to three thousand days, I suppose. Um, I, I worked it out before that um, if you target big fish, you'll find them. But if you're just kind of generally fishing for all, for you know, for for everything across the board, it takes about three hundred days to catch a double-figure fish. Yeah, that's, so you, that's you got around about time. how it works. Yeah, yeah, yeah. you got to. Yeah, but the average yeah, is gotta, three, four pounds, is it? Yeah, yeah. The average is three to four pounds. Yeah. Very nice. Um, and in terms of you said in terms of targeting the, the larger fish, how what's what? How do you go about doing that? It's more about location. Um, like if if you want to if you want to target if you want to target big fish, you have to fish rivers where big fish exist. Um, and uh, like there's one, one of those rivers um, here, um, generally speaking, in a day on it, I tried to cover about eight kilometers of river. And in that eight kilometers, I, I'd expect to see between four and eight fish. So, you know, so basically one fish or half a fish per kilometer. That's all that would be that you're seeing. Like, is there a lot more or is, it, or is it just that's what there's not seeing? a lot. There, there, there will be more fish there, but not a lot more. Not a lot more. In fact, I think there was one day I, I fished, I, I fished, um, fished that section where I believe every single fish in the river was out feeding that day. It was, it was incredible. Um, and that day in that eight kilometer section, I saw about 20 to 25 fish. So I reckon that's about the absolute limit of, of what's actually in it. Um, but on any given, on any given day, uh, you'll, you'll, you you'll see, yeah, maybe four to eight. And then when you do get the opportunity, you have to you have to put the fly in the right place. Or like quite often you find a fish, but he's impossible to catch simply because of where he is. You know, he's under a tree or under a log or cut in under a cut bank or something. So with so few fish there, you got to be a better angler, you know, in terms of being able to take your chances and know what you're doing. Yeah, you do. You you, you do. Um, well, again, the key is, yeah, you do. You have to be you have to be able to make the cast. Um, it's it's casting. New Zealand fishing is casting oriented. If you're a good, accurate caster, you'll do well over here. If you if you if you don't cast well, you'll struggle. You know, you'll mess up your chances. Um, and and that's 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 what it is. So so when I'm walking up that river, it's all about sight fishing. Um, so you also have to be able to see the fish, and that that's that's the other skill involved. It's not just about being able to make the cast. You have to be able to see the fish. And uh, in fact. I remember that learning curve when I first came to New Zealand. Um, I couldn't see the fish, and I remember my friend took me out for with a guy. Uh, he had a, he hired a guide, and he took me out with him for the day. And uh, this guy took this guy. His name was uh, Bonnie Burgess. He was a, a guide out of Gore, and he took myself and my friend Bob out. And he kept pointing out these fish to me, and I was I couldn't see them. He like he'd say, just there beside that white rock, and I was I'd look I'd look beside the white rock. I wouldn't see a thing. But time after time, I make my cast. The fly would drift over the white rock. Down the down would go the dry, and I'm into a fish. And I started thinking, he can't see these fish. He just knows they're there. And then I, and then I did. Then I was thinking, nah, no, no, don't be ridiculous. He can see them. And at the end of the day, anyway, I I I realized what I what I had to be able to do to succeed in New Zealand. Um, so that was a really really good good learning day. I mean, he didn't just teach me an awful lot about the tactics required on most rivers. 
but he taught me about how to read water, how to see fish, and uh, that was that that was where I really I remember that that was where I really started to improve on the New Zealand fishery. Is it um, dry dropper that you use mainly, or what's what? Yeah, mostly a dry, mostly a, mostly a dry fly with a with a nymph under it. Yep. And what did they take yep. most of the time? Uh, mostly the nymph, okay. mostly the nymph. Um, is there much dry during fly the summer? And oh, there is. There's heaps of dry fly fishing. Yeah, but I, I'm I'm a great believer in the nymph. It, it takes a lot for me to take the nymph off because personally, I don't care what they eat. Um, it, 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 like a lot of people are, are, they really want to see the head come out and take the dry. But for me, it's just I look at the fish and I just watch what the fish is doing. And if the fish is, if I see a fish taking a dry, but then making you know, seven or eight swings left and right taking nymphs. Well, I'm not going to just put a dry on. I'll have my dry and my nymph because he's more, he's, he's nymphing more than he is taking off the top. So, so that's the method I'll use, you know, it's not at all complicated. Uh, I mean, the New, the New Zealand f- fishery is, it's, if the fly doesn't matter a damn. You could take um, a terrible fly, very well presented is more likely to catch a fish, uh, to, more likely to catch a fish than a, a beautifully fly, a beautiful fly badly presented why are the fish so much bigger over new zealand Ron? i don't know <laughs> i don't know i really don't know i've i've been asked this question and i've thought about it myself and uh, uh one theory i heard was that that we have a longer growing season over here so um i guess milder conditions leads to uh the fish being able to feed for longer um but i think there's a, there's and I, I, the other reason is it's it ha, it it's quite possibly it's down to the low numbers of fish, um, that they're not competing for food so much as in, you know, like a lot of the Irish rivers are, you know, they're really loaded with small trout, whereas over here you don't you don't see those small fish very often. Um, and I don't know again I don't know why that is. I mean some of these rivers are just glorious. You you would imagine you you think that every little gutter and run will have you know heaps of half to three quarter pound trout but they just don't um and why i have no idea i have no idea so you you were you went full-time then in new zealand 2011 so you kind of made the decision well look you're spending enough time over there the fishing was good enough you decided to have a go at it yeah yeah i just decided uh, it, it, i decided i'd move out to new zealand um i think it was always in the back of my mind that i'd become a guide uh, that i that i would you know it, it it just it seemed like a good place to it seemed like a good a good good thing to do um but at the same time it, it wasn't it wasn't uh, it wasn't a, a goal that i had laid out for myself that has to happen um and uh, so i mean even when i moved to new zealand in 2011 um i started working as a joiner and i worked as a joiner for four years and uh and then when i got my when i got my uh, my residency that's when i set up the guiding business and um yeah, it just it, it went from there, really. Yeah. And how has it been in terms of the guiding business? How, like, is it a case of just trying to get your name out there? Obviously, writing a blog, doing some kind of TV stuff, that kind of stuff, just to kind of. Well, yeah, I guess I guess more than more than anything, it's um, it's word of mouth. Uh, like, I, I really don't I don't think much work came from the little bit of TV stuff we did over here, or or uh, or the blog certainly does generate some some interest. Um, but the most thing that gets that that gets work is is um, um, fellas come over, have a great time, and they go and tell their friends, and they come over and they have a great time, and they tell their friends, and, and then 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 your name gets out pretty quick. So like it it, it, it my first season was was pretty good, and um, and then every other season has been 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 chaco since like really full. So it's it's been a yeah it, it I kind of kind of hit the ground running. Uh, uh, now it wasn't entirely my own my own doing like i had some a lot of great friends in the industry and uh, they were they were happy to help me out and uh, happy to send me quite a lot of referrals um and uh, the local guides were uh, well, were key to the key to being successful in starting up you know i have a lot a lot to thank them for and te- i know because I've, I've seen on your website ronan's fly fishing missions.com the pictures are look just incredible i can imagine you know for anyone contemplating when you see the pictures you just it's mouthwatering like i still get really excited about it i mean the other the, the, the other day when I, when i when when i had my first day's fishing in a month and i got to the river i i was nearly running down the river to get to get to the well, I walk downstream to fish back to the truck and i was quite honestly um, almost at a jog because I, I i just couldn't wait to get at the uh, at the water um but, you know so I, I mean i still have that i still have that mad enthusiasm for the fishery and for the fishing uh, it's because it's so much fun 
it's just it's just a really it's an incredibly exciting exhilarating fishery uh, i mean it's um yeah, it, I, I I just love it. I mean, my father's been out with me a few times, not not a few times. He's been out with me about ten times now. I mean, he's he's kind of similar to me. Um, I mean, he's in fact, I think he, <laughs> I don't think he's lost one ounce of enthusiasm in all his in all his years of years of fishing. And uh, uh, like he came out in two thousand and four, I think the first time. And uh, when he was going home, he said, "I think that now might be my last visit." And I said, "Why on earth would it be your last visit?" Harry, you know, he said, oh, you know, finances or whatever. Like, I said, Harry, don't be daft, I said. And anyway, so the next year he was out again, and and a couple of years later he was out again, and and uh, and now it's just a now it's just an ongoing thing. It's it, you know, like it's it just get, it gets under it gets under your skin. I mean, it's it's a it's a it's an amazing fishery. Yeah, well, I suppose more Irish people should try it, and uh, like you said, it'll, it'll get under your skin and you'll come back. Um, Ronan, yeah. before I let you go, yeah. just tell me about the. Uh, the lockdown how you got like New Zealand were, were one of the earliest ones really to kind of go into lockdown and take the medicine I suppose take the quick hit of it and it seems to have worked out fingers crossed for you guys give us a, tell us yeah a it, it. I mean yeah we, we, we the lockdown happened fairly 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 quickly I think we went into lockdown at, at uh, less than 300 cases and uh, and and now now we're getting I think less than two cases a day or two, like two or three or five cases a day, something like that. Uh, but it looks like we might, like the South Island hasn't had a case for six or seven days, I think. Um, so, um, uh, so it, it looks like we're on the right track, but unfortunately for me as a guide, uh, uh, like there's no, no tourists coming over and none of just about none of my work is, is domestic. So um, basically my business has, has, has shut down. But um, but the lockdown itself has has is proving, I, I suppose, pretty successful. So how much of your business of did you lose from the season? Was it about six weeks? Uh, about it? twenty, about twenty, yeah, about twenty twenty five percent. Right. Okay. Of my season. So because yeah, the season more. What's the season run from in New Zealand? Uh, the season starts at the beginning of October uh, and runs to the end of April. So that's yeah. But my my October this year for some reason was 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 very quiet. Um, so I had a slow start and then this, then this end of the season was, wasn't, wasn't so great. Mm, yeah, <laughs> to, yeah. You know, this, it really, and, uh, so it, what do you do in the off season then? Um, I do a bit of work for a landscaping company sometimes. Um, and, uh, I do, I make a bit of furniture for the house. So I have a little workshop beside the house. So I, I, I I'm always in there making something, but, um, uh, yeah, so basically basically that's it kind of hobby woodworking and a little bit of landscaping for for a few coins and would you go out fishing yourself in the off season or do you kind of like to to oh yeah yeah no 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 god no i'll fish um um i'll fish uh, uh, at least once twice three times a week (laughs) you you can't help it no (laughs) (laughs) well listen continued success for um for the for your guiding career in New Zealand and for making such a success of it um, so if people want to find out more it's Ronan's Fly Fishing Missions dot com is the website to get in touch um, yep. and like I said if you go on the gallery this the, the fish it's just it's a different different game altogether than, oh, yeah. than what we're used to oh, well, that, yeah. oh well, thanks Derek thanks for, thanks for putting, that, putting that out there hopefully uh, hopefully somebody will get in touch <laughs> My thanks to Ronan Crean for joining me on the show and do check out Ronan's website at ronansflyfishingmissions.com for some incredible fish that he's caught. Don't forget to rate, review and subscribe to the podcast on Apple, Spotify or wherever you get your podcasts from. You can also keep up to date on irelandonthefly.com as well as on Instagram at irelandonthefly. Thanks for listening and I'll be back next week with another episode covering the people and places of fly fishing in Ireland.